All right, thank you. And um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about R and Spark. And I'm honestly really, really excited about this because um, last time I came here was around two years ago, and things have changed a lot. I don't know if uh, any of you attended my talk uh, two years ago, but uh, definitely there has been a lot of progress, so, so that's really exciting. And um, just to get started, I have, I have like two items on my personal agenda. One is obviously to let you know and uh, teach, teach what are the new developments that have happened um, around Spark, especially to make it really scalable when using, using R, using Apache Arrow. And the other part of the talk that I'm going to use a few minutes at the very beginning is just to introduce R and why, is, why R is great uh, in general. And, and I know that a lot of, um, especially on the, on the Spark community, not everyone is familiar with R and uh, use other computing languages. Um, so, so I'm also really excited just to share my passion of uh, why I love R and why I think R is a great, uh, a great language for doing data science. So this is how the talk looks like. We're going to do a quick intro to R. Um, we're going to recap how R works, uh, how you can use R with Spark. Uh, so if you don't know anything about how to use R with Spark, like this talk should also help you get up and running and uh, kind of like get you up to speed. And uh, then we're going to spend the rest of the talk basically figuring out how to use Arrow in R and how to use Arrow, R, and Spark together to get uh, really scalable uh, workflows and uh, interesting uh, use cases that you can use when using the three of them together. Um, so what is R? Um, if you look at the R website, um, the definition that you would find is R is a programming language for statistical computing. Right? And, and to me, what is really interesting about this definition is that if you look for the definition of what data science is, I'll, what you're going to find out is that a lot of people mention that data science is a discipline that uses uh, statistics and advancements on uh, computer science. Um, so to me, this is relevant because um, pretty much R as a programming language is uh, and was designed for doing data science, even though the term might, might, not, might, not, might not have been the exact same term um, uh, at that time. And for this particular talk, like the three things that I want to highlight about uh, R as a language uh, is one that is vectorized. And uh, more importantly for this talk is that it's columnar, which is going to be very relevant when we talk about Arrow and why you can be so uh, get uh, significant performance improvements when using both of them. And last but not least, um, R is a great programming language because it's flexible. And uh, my favorite diagram um, that was shared on USR 2016 uh, by Rick, Rick Becker is it, a diagram from uh, John Chambers that uh, he basically put together when he was designing S, uh, the S programming language, which is the precursor to R. And, and basically what this diagram shows is that um, uh, they were trying to find a way of making um, a statistical computing more efficient on a user for, for users and also um, better in general by not having to deal with low level routines, but rather by focusing on um, doing a statistics at a high level. And, and that's kind of like what he's trying to show this, this diagram is like the outer box shows what this algorithm algorithmic interface could look like, and in the inside is uh, an existing um, uh, code that was originally written in Fortran that, you know, eventually, um, you know, uh, would kind of like um, encourage, encourage them to create better interfaces, and in this case, S, that um, is a precursor of R. And the, the other great thing about R, or that I personally love, is uh, just the ginormous uh, community uh, uh, behind all the R packages that are available in CRAN. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, CRAN is basically R's uh, package manager, and it's similar to NPM for JavaScript or Maven for Java. And um, it's just great because a lot of times, like the same uh, uh, statisticians and data scientists that build uh, uh, publish papers and advancements in general in modeling, uh, it's, it's not uncommon to see that they're the same authors of uh, statistical packages that you can find in the R community. And, and it's also pretty healthy to see that the growth of the R community. Uh, this is basically, it's a chart that tracks downloads, uh, daily downloads of R packages uh, from CRAN. And, and you can see that year over year, um, you know, the usage of these packages has been growing, which, which is pretty exciting. Um, this is still pretty abstract, I think. Um, I don't know if, if my previous self were to explain me what this is. Like, I don't know if I would really have understood what, why R is great. Um, so I wanted to show like one particular package um, 
that you know, like it doesn't really, it's not necessarily related with data science, but I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. And it gives a good example of why R is great. Um, so, so the package that I want to uh, mention is Ray Render. Uh, this is a package that um, Tyler Morgan Wall has been developing. And it's basically a ray tracing uh, package that, um, you know, as, as you might know, ray tracing is a technique that is used on animation studios to, you know, render um, high quality um, photorealistic images for movies like, I don't know, um, you know, from Pixar or DreamWorks. And, um, you know, he tweeted about this like a, a few weeks ago. And, and, and I thought of sharing this because what, what is great is that uh, you can see on the right side basically how our code looks like for rendering a 3D scene uh, that he's, he's been working on. And it's, it's quite simple. Like, um, I could probably get my kids to write this and, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's a project that I can take on at some point. But, but basically, it's, it's pretty simple. You basically say, I want to generate a an, an scene. I want to add an object and I want to render the scene. That's, that's about it. And for those of you that are familiar with the tidyverse, um, it, it also speaks to the degree of detail that a lot of uh, package authors and the art community put to making your life easier. And, and the other part that is really descriptive for this package is that um, the actual computation, like the, the actual ray tracing computation is being done uh, natively uh, using uh, the RCPP package, which is basically a wrapper for C++ code. Um, so kind of like it describes how you can mix in using R, you can have like the best of both worlds, where you have a very, a, a great high level interface, while you also have the performance of using C++ and, na and native code um, in a nicely integrated way. All right, so, so that was my brief intro to, to R. Uh, we're gonna jump into how to use R with Spark. And, and for this, I thought that the best way of presenting this is just um, presenting how this has evolved since 2016 when we started working on Sparkly R, which is a package that provides an R interface to Spark. And um, I'm, I'm gonna go through all the releases pretty fast, but um, should give you a good idea of all the functionality that is available in Sparkly R. So the first release adds support to install, connect, analyze, model, and extend Spark. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so we basically want to make Sparkly R, and in general R, uh, to be the easiest way to do cluster computing uh, from any programming language. And, and in order to accomplish that, uh, we make um, we make some of the things like very, very straightforward. Uh, you can install Spark for your, for your own local personal use using Spark install. This is a one line call that you can just basically execute and will download a version, uh, the latest version of Spark and make it ready for you to work locally. And all these using R. Um, and then you can connect. Um, if you're using a local cluster, you can just say, the Spark Connect Master equals, equals local, but you can, you can also uh, connect to Mesos clusters, uh, Yarn clusters, you know, or Spark standalone, all of them running Spark uh, with, the same, uh, with the same command. And, and then you can do data analysis. And data analysis meaning you can read uh, from multiple data sources, you can write into multiple data sources, or you can transfer data into and outside of Spark. Um, for those of you familiar with R, Deplier is a great package for doing data manipulation. Um, and uh, you, can use, you can use the familiarity of the plier with uh, Sparkly R. And if, you, if you're familiar with SQL and you prefer to use SQL, you can use the DBI package and execute uh, SQL statements directly from R. Um, you also have access to all the MLLeaf modeling functions. Um, and uh, you can also build extensions using uh, Sparkly R even, even from this, release, uh, this initial release. Uh, one of the extensions worth highlighting is you can use H2O on Spark using Sparkly R with the R Sparkling package. Um, the next release was, was a bit of smaller release, uh, but uh, we focused a lot on improving connections. Um, Sparkly R supports connecting to uh, Apache Levy um, web services, which um, Apache Levy is basically a REST API for interactive data analysis on top of Spark. And while I must mention that uh, Apache Levy is much slower than actually using a proper connection in the cluster, um, a, lot of, a lot of Spark users, especially when they're getting started with uh, Spark and Sparkly R and R, um, don't have a cluster uh, available yet with R install and all the tooling. So, so it's a really great way of getting, getting you up and started. And um, obviously, um, uh, Sparkly R also supports Databricks connections. Uh, this was for, since release 05. And it's also certified with Cloudera, which helps, uh, helps those of you who have Cloudera cl uh, clusters. Um, so the next big feature that we worked on uh, was uh, basically distributed R computations on, on Sparkly R. And basically what that means is allowing you to execute arbitrary R code in, um, 
in Spark. And uh, you know, even though the feature is pretty, pretty old, uh, got implemented somewhere in 2000, early 2017, um, I put together a, a little demo early um, in the week, which basically uses the Ray render package uh, to render, you know, like a simple scene using full HD and, you know, like uh, 30 frames per second type of um, kind of animation. And what, what is really cool is that it's, it's really easy to get these um, started, right? So, you know, um, you can create a 3D scene. And in this case, what I'm doing, I'm creating a table, a distributed table with all the camera positions that I want to render. I'm using, uh, I'm using Dplyr to actually create that table of different positions that I want to render. Uh, and then the function that you use when you want to do uh, distributed R computations, um, it's Spark Apply. Uh, the way Spark Apply works is basically it takes your R code and allows you to transform each partition in your large data set with, a, with custom R code. And not only that, but it also distributes all your R packages, or you, know, uh, uh, you can distribute a subset, but basically allows you to use all your R packages to use the packages on each cluster, in each node of your cluster. So in this, in this case, what we're saying is we're saying um, apply a transformation over the distributed camera uh, data set. And what I want you to do is basically uh, use the ray render package to render a scene um, you know, with this particular configuration, you know, like with this particular camera position, and render it and store it in, in HDFS. Uh, once you have like all the images, which is the most computationally expensive piece on, on, on this particular um, um, uh, use case, then you can just uh, retrieve all the images from Hadoop and just stitch them together into uh, an animation, which is, which is uh, what a lot of animation studios do. And again, this is, this is a silly, silly example, but it, it kind of like showcases um, like very clearly like kind of like the type of interesting use cases that you can consider when, when using um, the richness of the CRAN packages with uh, kind of like the power of compute of, of Spark. Um, Sparkly R07 add, added support for uh, Spark pipelines and all the, all the features uh, from uh, MLEAF as, as in making them feature complete and making sure that all, all of the functionality was available. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Spark pipelines, um, I, I would describe Spark pipelines as a cross-language um, description of your machine learning um, process, right? So, you know, usually when you're prototyping um, you know, a solution on data science, like you usually use a specific data set and then you apply transformations to do data analysis and perform modeling over the data set, which is great for a, a specific use cases. Uh, but when you want to productionize this uh, process, you might want to update the data set, say, on a weekly basis or daily basis, right? Um, so what you can do with Spark pipelines is you can basically follow the same patterns that you do when, when processing um, information using um, just R and Spark, uh, but leave, leave unspecified the, um, your data set. So in this case, what we're doing is we're creating a pipeline, we're ap applying a transformation, and then we're running a linear regression. Uh, but as you can see here, like the data set is not specified. Uh, so what you can do with this pipeline is you can export it, and then someone in your team that, you know, perhaps the data engineering team wants to take this over and maintain it, maintain it over time and use Python, what they can do is they can load the pipeline and apply the transformation themselves from Python. Or you can do it also from R, and in this case you can run ML feed pipeline and, you know, a specific data set, and what you would get would, get, would be the fitted uh, pipeline with, uh, with, the, with the fitted model. And again, uh, I, I, I think one of the greatest, um, well, the best feature of this particular release is that we went over the whole ML leave um, set of modeling functions and algorithms, and we made sure that all of them were implemented in Sparkly R so, uh, so that you can be sure that you have parity with the functionality available in, in ML leave. Um, so next release, um, ML, we added support on Sparkly R08 for MLib and graphs. Um, MLib is some, somewhat related with pipelines. Spark pipelines still require Spark to be executed, right? So you can, your data engineering team can take an R, a, a Spark pipeline written in R and then move it to Python, right? Uh, but you can't really, you still need Spark to execute that, that pipeline. Um, what the ML, MLib um, package and also extension um, enables you to do is you can take the Spark pipeline and export it into a Java 
um, compatible model that you can execute on in, any Java-enabled device. Uh, so, so say that you want to, um, you know, to use this model in, your, in an Android application, you know, in an Android mobile application, or if you want to uh, perform scoring directly on your wa Java web server, um, you could use M MLIP extension to extract that pipeline from Spark and then run it directly on your web server or in your mobile uh, device. And uh, the other interesting extension that uh, we added as part of the Sparkly R 08 release is the ability to process graph, uh, graphs in general. Uh, this uses graphs, uh, the graph frame library, which is powered by GraphX, which is a Spark component. And uh, what that allows you to do is basically do graph processing in, in R. Uh, in this case, I have a partial example of what you could do, which is uh, you can create, create a graph frame from a table that contains vertices and edges and then you can uh, calculate page rank over it. But there's, there's a few other algorithms that are uh, you know, targeting graph processing in this, in this particular extension. Sparkly R09, which was released late uh, 2018, or middle, mid, mid late uh, 2018, uh, the big feature that we made, made, made available for you there is um, Spark structured streams, which uh, if you've been in Spark and if you attended last year, uh, was one of the most, um, you know, uh, newest features that got added to, in, to Spark. And, and basically what, um, what Spark structured streaming allows you to do is uh, process real-time uh, real data with the same ease of use that you can uh, use to process large-scale data sets. And um, the way that this, this, is, this is made available in R is by um, um, adding a few additional prefixes to your data ingestion, to your data reading and data writing operations. So uh, rather than using Spark read text to read a text file from Amazon, uh, what you can do to do uh, build a real-time um, scoring or transformation pipeline is uh, to use instead the function stream read text. So it's, it's very similar. It, it almost has the same parameters. Uh, but what, it, that, what this function will do is create Spark structured stream for you uh, that in this particular case is reading data from an Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, so that this means that all, uh, Spark is going to be continuously uh, pulling um, Amazon S3 to find new, in this case, new log, uh, logs being written into the S3 bucket that you can automatically um, ingest into Spark and do further data processing. Um, in this particular example, what we're, what we're processing are S3 logs. Um, you can configure Amazon um, storage to basically write into a log file any download or any access to your, uh, to the, to your actual S3 account. Uh, but, but the log format that S3 writes these records in, it's pretty convol convoluted. So it's, you can use a regular expression to parse this, but it's pretty, it's pretty hard. Uh, so instead, what, what we're doing here, which I think is pretty straightforward, uh, we're using Spark Apply, which is um, this helper function to allow us to execute our across all the nodes in your cluster, and we're using the Weep Read R package. This is an R package specifically designed to parse logs, and they support parsing um, S3 logs, which makes it really easy just in one line of code to get the raw data, parse it with an R package, and have, uh, end up having a data frame with all the columns and all the information that is relevant to you. Um, but, but it doesn't stop there. Like once you have these, um, the data parsed in, in a format that you can, you can do data analysis in, uh, you can also use Deplier to, in this case, group by the URI. So you can figure out what, uh, you can group by basically the uh, locations that are, uh, the files that are being downloaded from your, um, uh, your um, S3 bucket. And then you can summarize, so you can count and not only that, but you can also use a uh, deployer's arrange comment to also order in decreasing order, and then you can write this information back somewhere. Um, in this particular example, we're just writing to an in-memory table, but um, a, a more, more common use case is to grab data from Apache Kafka, read it with stream read Kafka, and then basically write the data back to Kafka, or, you, or save it in, you know, in, in a parquet format or, or why not, and use it as part of uh, data analysis and you know, further modeling. Um, this release also adds support for uh, Kubernetes, which um, some of, uh, of you might, might already be familiar with. Um, is becoming quite popular, and it really allows you to use clusters, not just for Spark computing, but also um, other applications that you, can, um, that you can take advantage while using, using Spark. 
So this brings us back, back to the last release of Sparkly R, which was released um, earlier in the year. And the big feature that we added on Sparkly R01 that we're, 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 we're going to um, talk about it in detail, it's Arrow. So um, Arrow enables basically faster and la larger data transfers when using Spark and R. Uh, but let's pause it for a second. And I'll just mention that the other two features that are relevant on Sparkly R01 is uh, the XG, Spark XGB extension, which allows you to train XGBoost models on Spark. Um, I know that a lot of you are familiar with XGBoost, and it's a pretty popular library um, and very useful library in general uh, when, when doing modeling outside of Spark. And so it's great to have it also available for training large data sets. And uh, the Spark TF extension allows you to write tensor, TensorFlow records, which um, a, a, common, a common practice when dealing uh, with large data sets and deep learning models is to try to reduce the large data set into something that is manageable on a single GPU that you can train. Um, so you can, use, you can use R and Spark to basically condense these large data sets into something that is manageable on a GPU, and then use Keras or TensorFlow to do actual GPU processing on Spark, sorry, on, uh, on, the, G on the GPU. All right, so uh, let's, let's, let's go into the details of Arrow. So, so first of all, what is Arrow? And again, the definition from the uh, Apache Arrow side is Apache Arrow is a cross-language development platform for in-memory data. Um, I, I, I think it's more intuitive to actually explain the diagram from the website. And basically, a common problem that you will see in data science and in general in software engineering is you have multiple systems. Like, for instance, we have R and we have Spark, and we want to transfer data between them. And you know, it's, it's kind of trivial when you only have two systems. You connect one system with the other system, and it's great, whatever. Um, but usually, it happens to be the case that you just don't have Spark and R, but you also have Spark and uh, Python, and you have like other systems. And basically, what ends up happening is you, you, you have to transfer data between these different systems. And it happens to be the case that you, you're basically paying the cost of transferring data between them. And you also don't, don't have any guarantee of you know, if you transfer data from Spark to R to, R to Python and Python to Spark, are, are you sure that the data types and the, um, and the actual data is the same? Um, so, so in general, the Arrow project um, simplifies this and makes it more efficient by having a sim single representation of the data across all the systems. And um, this would be what is the, um, you know, usually refer an, an Arrow in memory data set. And this is also great from a performance point of view. Um, if we go back to that um, thing that I highlighted about R, that R is columnar, um, Arrow also happens to be columnar. And the reason why uh, processing data in columnar format is important when doing data intensive operations is because usually, if you think about it, when you're doing data analysis, a lot of the operations that you do um, are related with a specific column. So you, you want to say things like, I want to filter by column, or I want to calculate the mean and the max or the average of one particular column. So what happens at a very low level, if you look at the CPU, and if, if you're storing your data in, in, row, in, in a row format, uh, what, what ends up happening is like the CPU basically needs to look at each row and then not, not do anything with, with the other columns and just basically skip them. And uh, they could also be different data types or you know, et cetera. So it actually doesn't make use, great use of the CPU. However, if you store the data in columnar format, then what you, you can basically send all that data through a CPU, and the CPU can process uh, very efficiently operations over each column. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why R was designed with uh, columnar support from, from the very beginning, and why it's, why it's becoming also more uh, pretty, like a pretty popular way of storing data and processing data. Uh, so how do, you, how do you use Arrow in, in R? Um, so the first thing to mention is that um, there was already an initiative going on, I believe, around 2017 uh, with the Feather package. Um, the way that the Feather package is described is a lightweight binary columnar data store designed for maximum speed based on Arrow's memory layout. Uh, and basically what this means is that um, Wes and Hadley, uh, two well-known contributors from the Python and R communities, r respectively, uh, they basically got a subset of what Arrow provides, and uh, they made it available for Python and R. Um, the, the caveat for Feather is that it's based on files. Uh, it's very simple to use, and it's actually quite powerful. It allows you to take an R data frame, save it into, um, into, into a file that is optimized 
um, for being read both from Python and from R. Um, so if, if you have a team that is using both Python and R and you're not using Fedor, it's probably something worth considering because um, you get basically, you basically get the efficiency of using RDAs, which are the binary representation of R data frames when they get persisted, and the same, the same performance also when lo loading back on, on Python. Uh, so that was kind of like the initial um, approach that the R community took to support Arrow in, in R. Uh, last year, uh, development started to uh, uh, support the actual Arrow package for, uh, for R in, and in general for the R community. Um, it, it has been under development since Arrow 11. Uh, it was mostly feature complete on Arrow 12, and it's, um, it was released um, on Arrow 13 um, earlier, uh, actually a couple weeks ago, um, almost a month ago. And uh, it's on its way to CRAN, and so um, we're, I'm, I'm personally really excited to also see it in CRAN. Uh, but for now, you can basically install it with install from GitHub, Apache Arrow, uh, subdirectory, and then a particular checkpoint, which is uh, the 013 release. Um, it is worth mentioning that uh, you need to install the Arrow runtime by yourself for now, at least until it gets released on CRAN. Uh, so basically, that means that you need to go to the Arrow website, install the runtime, and then install the R package. Um, so it's, it's not that hard, but it's also not trivial. Uh, once it's on CRAN, it's going to be pretty trivial to use. And uh, the way that you use Arrow, the Arrow package is similar to what, the way that you would use Fedor. And it actually also supports Fedor, Fedor files. So you can read and write Fedor files. Uh, but it, also, you can use other file formats like Parquet. And for those of you familiar with Spark, um, it is pretty common to st store data in Parquet format, which also happens to be columnar. When, uh, when using Apache Spark. Um, so it's great to have everything on a, on a, single, on a single package. Um, but again, as, as I was mentioning, Arrow is very focused on being a developer platform. So most users might not need to use Arrow directly. Um, but it's package authors like my, myself and some of you that might be really excited about this, which is if, um, Arrow also allows you to um, take a uh, data frame and uh, serializes in, in memory for you to use for other applications, um, which, is, which is the reason why I was really excited to, uh, in, that, to see us implementing this on Sparkly R. Because um, if, if we want to make a, a data transfer faster between R and Spark, a great, a great way of doing that is by sharing a memory um, format between both systems and then transferring that information between them um, with this. All right, so um, how do you do RO on Spark and R? I guess this, R, this talk is about R, so this is implied. Um, so first of all, some requirements. RO, RO was implement, uh, support for RO uh, became available in Spark 2.3, so you need a Spark, uh, Spark 2.3 cluster or newer in order to use RO. Um, you, you also need the RO runtime. Um, I would recommend using RO 13. Uh, it's, usable with Arrow 12 and barely usable with Arrow 11, but definitely you want to, you want to, you want to install the uh, 013 runtime, which is basically the latest release of Arrow. Um, you need uh, R 3.5 or newer, although um, there's an open pull request that I believe has been merged to also support Arrow 3.1 um, uh, in, in, in the next release of Arrow. And you need Sparkly R01 or, or newer. And um, so, so, uh, how, do, how does it, this work, and why, why do we get like, such a huge performance improvement when using Arrow with Spark and R? And, and in order to understand that, first we need to explain um, how it works today without Arrow. So um, a, a lot of times when you work with uh, data in Spark, uh, the, the data is formatted in uh, row format. So for instance, if you're using uh, a row, um, in a RDD row in Spark, um, it's likely that they've, uh, um, it's going to be starting the data is going to be stored in, a, in, in row format. So that's, in, this, in this particular example, you know, we have a character column, and we have like two in integers. And basically, you know, the data looks like that. It's, it's just a row. Uh, so first of all, today we need to transform the uh, row from being on a Spark format into R format, which you know, there, there are different types of um, runtime, so they needs, it needs to be transformed. And, and that has a cost. And not only that, but since R uh, processes data in columnar format, we also need to transform the data from being row-based to being column-based. So um, you know, once, once you get all the way to R, then you can do processing, 
which is the case for when you collect data from Spark to R. Uh, when you copy data from R into Spark, you basically need to do the opposite um, you know, workflow, you know, um, which is the data gets converted from columnar format to, row, to a row rep representation that R understands that get, then gets translated to a, a row representation that Spark understands. And when you're doing things like Spark Apply to do uh, distributed R computing, this is even worse because you need to go from Spark to R, execute the, your particular transformation, and then you, know, you need to go back from R to Spark every time. Uh, so so um, the, the big improvement here is that um, with, uh, with, with Arrow support um, in, in Spark, Spark can now transform the row, uh, row representation into columnar representation in parallel. Um, so if you have a big cluster, you can, uh, Spark basically is going to transform this, this data for you. And then um, once, once it's in Arrow format, there is no transformation that needs to happen. R already processes data in columnar format. So you can basically just uh, transfer the data. Well, not, you don't need to do anything. Everything is done for you. But you know, under the covers, the data just needs to be transferred between Spark and R without any transformation whatsoever. All right, so the really exciting um, uh, you know, you know, thing to, to, to notice is like, what are the performance improvements that we get? And uh, well, first of all, like in order to use Arrow, you basically need to say library Arrow when using Spark and R and Sparkly R. And, and, and then you, you can copy some data. So in this case, we're copying one million rows. Um, please note that I use my personal computer, like my MacBook Pro, to get these benchmarks. Um, you can obviously work with much more data if you have a bigger cluster. But just to give a sense of what are, how the improvement looks like, um, you know, this, this is the benchmark that, benchmark that we can look at. Uh, so uh, copying one million rows, basically, uh, without using um, Arrow, it takes about three seconds. Using Arrow takes about a second. Uh, but what is most more interesting is that since Arrow is reusing the memory layout, you can copy much more data when using Arrow. Um, for instance, if you're not using Arrow and you're using my particular computer with the default um, memory settings, which is less than a gigabyte, uh, it, you know, R is just going to crash cause, or Spark is just going to crash with out of memory exception because there's just not enough memory to transfer uh, the data set, but you can, you can transfer it with Arrow. Something, something similar happens with collect. So when you're collecting a data set, in this case, we're collecting 10 million rows. Um, you know, it takes about 11 seconds when you're, when, when you're not using Arrow. It takes about three seconds when you uh, have Arrow turned on. And you can also collect as much as five times more data when using Arrow. Um, if you're wondering why we don't get the exact same performance improvements between copying and collecting, um, the answer here is because we spent time already optimizing the collection process uh, in Sparkly R. So it's already doing some columnar transformations, um, which, you know, um, you know, it's good news if you're already using Sparkly R, but, you know, explain why we don't get 10 times um, the improvement. But still, like a 5x improvement is um, it's pretty great by, by any means. And um, the last one to consider is transformations. And uh, as I was mentioning, this, is, this piece of code happens, used to be very um, intensive on the transformations that need to happen. Uh, so for, for this particular case, you know, my particular machine, I have 100,000 records. And if I were to, um, you know, just a very simple transformation, and, and, and notice that this is R code. This is not, you know, like Scala code getting, trans, you know, translator or whatever. Like this is actual R code that is going to be executed across your cluster. Um, you're, you know, we're ba making doing a very simple operation. We're basically dividing all the values, the values by two. But but even no matter what operation you execute, you basically need to transfer the data from Spark to R, do all the transformation from column, columnar to row, row to column, and then send it back. Uh, so the performance improvement that, that we'll get are pretty, pretty insane. Uh, we're seeing that it's about uh, 40 times faster with the same data. And just for comparison, you can basically process, uh, you know, like almost 10 times as much data for a fraction of the time. So uh, we have five minutes left, and uh, we can do some questions. But I think I have time to show a quick demo. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to Spark in two different um, Spark sessions. So um, again, default settings and why not? And um, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, copy this code, and then I'm going to run it. And, and I'm actually going to re reduce it and, and even run less information. Uh, sorry, run less records. Then I'm going to here in, in, in the other session I'm going to do library arrow to make sure that arrow is enabled. 
and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run both. So in, in one case, I'm only doing 10,000 records. In the other case, I'm going to do a million records. Uh, so both are executing in parallel, one with arrow enabled, one, one without arrow, arrow enabled. Uh, so in, in, in one case, still, it's getting processed. Here, we already finished processing at uh, 1 million records. And it's it was actually faster than processing only 10,000 records, which is, is just pretty great. Um, so with that, um, that's all I have for you. And definitely, I want to leave you with some resources and time for questions, if any. So thank you. A question. So is the arrow that you showed, is it specific to Sparkler, or is it available in Spark R? Yeah, it's, it's actually currently only specific to Sparkly R. Um, I myself have been, and, and uh, the team at R Studio and community have mostly, ha we've only been working on Sparkly R. Um, I don't know what, what are the plans, but as, um, yeah, definitely, it is my understanding that it's not just supported on Spark R, but maybe I'm wrong, yeah. Okay, so I have a follow-up question, like, we have a lot of code on Spark R, so uh, is there a support for interoperability between Spark R and Sparkly R? So can you read the, the data as a Spark data frame? using yeah. Spark R, and then uh, convert to a Spark data frame and do the transformation and back again. Right. Is that well, I mean, there's definitely some things that you can do, right? Like, you can always persist the data. You know, like, you can do a transformation with Spark R, persist the data, and then load it back. Um, I know that in data, on the Databricks runtime, uh, the way that the connection was implemented um, enables you to support, I believe, Spark R and Spark R. But in general, the answer is, is no. Like, um, you know, like, you, you don't... Sh both, uh, both packages don't share the same uh, con uh, Spark context. So while you can use one you know, in one Spark session and the other one in another Spark session, they don't share memory because um, you know, they're different implementations, but yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, so you got two Apache projects, both focused on columnar storage, right? I probably looked this up like 10 times, you know, Arrow versus Parquet. Yep. How come you're continuing to talk about Arrow when all these big data frameworks have adopted Parquet? Is there something underlying that I'm missing, like better integration oh, yeah, yeah. of R and data frames and sparkling R? Or? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. Um, well, I, I want to leave the resources there for, for those of you that are using them. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Parquet is obviously pretty great, and, um, you know, it's, you know, something that you should use if, you know, you already have infrastructure that supports Parquet. Um, one of the interesting features for Arrow that we're currently not using on Sparkly R, but maybe that's something that we'll consider later. Um, so, as I mentioned, the way that Sparkly R and R worked today is basically by transferring the data from Spark into R, right? So, you basically... You know, you have a representation on Spark, you send it to R, which is great because there's no transformation, but still, like, you're, you're basically duplicating, um, you know, like, the amount of memory that you need in both cases, right? And there's, and there's also a data transfer cost, which, you know, like, is not trivial. Um, one, one of the features that Arrow supports, it allows also for different um, clients and technologies to share the same memory layout. So you don't even need to transfer the data set between Spark and R, ideally, but rather R should be able to use the memory that is already available in Spark. So, so that should even improve performance even further, uh, but that's you know, like maybe something on the roadmap for the future. So uh, we definitely see that. And, and you know, like I'm honestly not an, an expert on, on the Arrow project. I know that the Arrow project is also considering you know, support for GPU and you know, like additional computation and why not. So, so, it's a package, so it's a project that in general we see growing and that it's, it's probably uh, interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah. And then you just seem like a good person to ask because you're, because sure. you're talking about um, you know, all, all this interoperability in the big picture. Um, in our industry, R is really popular, but we also get asked about Python, yep. you know, and we, we don't want to maintain APIs for both. Um, have you found any gotchas with the reticulate package? If we just want to have an R API and then say, hey, do yeah. whatever you need and reticulate. Yeah, I mean, I would say that the particular package works pretty great. Um, it has been out for more than a year, and it, it definitely it's something that I would recommend using. And, and I think in general, um, there's, we're seeing more and more like, you know, mixed data science teams that are using R and Python. Um, so I honestly think that 
um, the direction is going to go that way. Um, myself, as, as I mentioned, I work in R Studio, and some of our products actually support now Python and R. So, you know, if you want to chat more, or if anyone wants to chat more about, you know, interoperability, uh, you, you can probably find me on the uh, R Studio booth after this this talk, and we can we can chat more. But, um, definitely, yeah. Thank you.